Okay, what, what's our problem with time? <clears throat> Why do we need to understand what time is? Who has time for this? So there are so many frustrations with time. It's like, you never have enough time. Or time passes too quickly. Or too slowly. Where did the time go? <laughs> the main problem is that if I, if I did something and I regret it, I can't fix it. I can't go back in time which almost everybody needs to do. I invested in a stock. I want to take it back. I bet on a horse. <laughs> I want to take it back. Uh, I can't. Too late. That's a real frustration. Some people are frustrated about the future. Since we don't know what the future is going to bring, it makes us anxious. Anticipatory anxiety. I'm not even sure what I'm worried about, just the fact that I don't know what's going to happen. I can't control. So here's, here's the, main, the main issue, the serious issue, not, not the philosophical games. I'm not in control of the past or of the future. And that's, that's uncomfortable, scary, whatever. <clears throat> so we seem to be under the control of time. We have no control over time. So there is, on page 61, <clears throat> that famous little poem that's also a Mordechai Ben David song. <clears throat> And it basically says, Ha'ovar ayin. The past is gone. The ha'osid adayin. The future isn't, isn't yet. The ha'heve, the present, is keheref ayin, only lasts a second. Imkein da'agom ayin. So what are we worried about? So let's do that again. The past is gone, the future is yet to come, and the present is like the blink of an eye, so what's to worry? Do you agree with that? <laughs> Isn't that exactly what we're worried about? <laughs> right, so this is not comforting. This is the problem. The problem is the past is gone. I can't fix it or undo it. And the future, I don't know. And the present, it disappears in a second. Come on, that's a lot of anxiety. So what's to worry? <laughs> that's to worry. So it can go either way. How does it go positively? The past is gone, so what do you, what do you want? It's done, it's finished. Move on. The future, it hasn't happened yet. What do you have to worry now that something, you know, you'll burn your bridges when, the t when you get there. What is that? <laughs> you'll cross that bridge when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> then, you'll, then you'll burn your bridge. <clears throat> and the present, it's only a second, so it only will hurt for a second. Comforting, so what's to worry about? They both make sense, which means it doesn't make any sense at all. If you can argue both ways equally, then you basically haven't said anything. So it could be this, and it could be the opposite. In other words, you haven't said anything. We know nothing. So now the question is, at least philosophically, what is the present? What's present? In a second, 
it becomes the past. So they start with a question. How do we know that there is a past? Maybe everything began just now. But I remember yesterday. Yeah, that memory was just created now. There was nothing before. We are created now with memories that, of things that never happened. So all reality begins now. Isn't that a fascinating question? <laughs> no. It, it's, it's like s splitting hairs unnecessarily. If there is no past, everything just began now, then a minute from now, what I'm thinking now is not going to be real anymore. So th this is just silly. Time is made up of past, present, and future. If there's no past, then there's no present. If there's no present, there's no future. You can't have one without the other or two without the third. But the question mainly is not about the past. We know. We had a long life. Many things happened. There's a long history before us. That's the past. The future can go on forever. But what is the present? What good is it? It's just a second. <clears throat> so, quoting from the Ikrim, and I'll read it in the English, time is something that does not actually exist. The past isn't here anymore. The future has not yet come into actuality. <clears throat> the present is just the now that connects past and future. So the now itself is not really a part of time. Can you call the present time? Just for that moment. For that moment it is time? It's always not past and present and future. But there's got to be a now. There's got to be. Yeah, there has to be. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Wouldn't Although, if there wasn't a now, how do we move from past to future? Isn't it just a continuum? Like, we're just moving and... The that's, part, that's part of the question of the nature of time. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So now itself is not really a part of time. Rather, its relationship to time is like the relationship of a point in a line. So time doesn't really exist. And yet time provides the full existence to everything that exists in time. I love this double talk. <laughs> it's supposed to be brilliant. Yeah. So what he's saying is that the present is the bridge between, so it itself is not time. It's an interesting thought, and, and it's going to be relevant later on. The present is really timeless, because time means change. The present means what is, not what changes. So imagine if time stopped. What would we have? Only the present, right? Time stop means it's not going to move into the future. So what will we be left with? The present. So after Mashiach comes or after Trias HaMesim, there's going to be a change in the world and we're going to live forever. Why? Because it will be continual or, or perpetual present. There will be no future because it's not going to change. So the present, although it's only a second, is not really time. It's what is. It's not what's changing. The change is from 
past to future. But in between past and future, there's a stable little second that isn't changing. It's the present. And that's why you should live in the present moment. Don't live in the past and don't worry about the future because they're just changes. The present is the reality. Although you can also argue, as he says here, that the present is nothing, just a little bridge. So again, which way do we go? Is it nothing, merely a bridge, or is it the reality or the stability of time, whereas past and present are, flux, are in flux and unstable? Okay. <clears throat> Can anything exist outside of time? Can there be existence without time? Yeah. Uh, can the moon exist without time? No. Because? We, 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 just, time. we just said that the reality is the present, which is time. So there is no So there is? <laughs> Who cares what the question was? We got the answer. Stop living in the past. <laughs> can the moon exist without time? Or in different words, can space exist without time? Yeah. I was going to say like the opposite is because the world is turning that there's time outside of the world. I mean, on the world, there, it's every time of the day somewhere in the whole world. It's like all of time is happening only at the world's cut. Outside the world, I was thinking like when you asked, is there anything beyond time? I was thinking, well, before birth and after death, there's no time. But those those neshamas are still in existence, even though they weren't. They're not in this time. That's what I was thinking. That's a good point. Is there time in heaven? Mm. Is there a heavenly time? Obviously, it's not an earthy time. But is there a spiritual form of time? You would think so. Yeah. 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 You know when so if time when stops... People like spiritually pass away, like they die, and then they, some miracle happens, and then they could, uh, like something comes into their, says it's not time for you to die, and then they come back to life. So there's... Somebody's keeping time up there. Yeah. <laughs> and the celestial clock. But it doesn't feel the same. No, it doesn't feel the same. Because spiritual is different than physical. So if time stopped, would everything disappear? No. And then time is just because of the world. How could time stop? Hand in hand. Time stopped in a moment. Get a cheap watch. <laughs> right? Hmm? No time stopped for your show? The sun stopped. The sun stopped, so time stopped. So um, no. What do you mean? Yeah, is there we're still going on. Right. Aging still yeah. happened, the process. Is, so is there time without the sun? that time space. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in that one it was just time day, zone. Just so there was a shift in time. Mm -hmm. was like it? the day lasted longer than the night or something, right? But it didn't move. The, so the, the was, sun didn't move. It was a present for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can stop time and things still exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> he stopped time and time went on. <laughs> time went on. <laughs> like you said, like in the times of Mashiach, we'll be in the present. Time's going to stop. We'll all be in the present. But things will happen. So that, that little piece of wisdom, you have to live in the moment. Is that because the moment is going to pass quickly or because the moment is all we have? So if we had an, a moment that lasts a year, Amazing. you should live in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing will change for a year and you're okay with that? aware of that moment 
Yeah. Yeah. Because if that moment doesn't seem good, then we wouldn't want to sit in that moment forever. That's you want part. You don't want to be stuck in a bad moment. <clears throat> huh? Say something? You don't give up your ability to choose an act right now because of the future. You're lying in the future. It's like using it as a crutch. You know, it's not walking straight. Walking straight is you do now. Because how can you rely on the future to rescue you? Okay. What you have is now. Yeah. So the real issue is free choice. That's what makes time valuable. After Mashiach comes or after Trias HaMason, there really won't be that kind of free choice. There'll be only good. So there won't be any change or movement from negative to positive. That kind of time will disappear. But let's see. <clears throat> Look at text six. One second. So the only benefit of the present is free choice. Is that what you just said? Or one of the great benefits is the choice to change? That's the benefit of time, okay. past, present, and future. Can't change the past. That's what we're going to find out. Okay. Haravi, the Rambam says, the fourth principle that we, that we believe in is the fact that God is primordial. The belief that God is absolutely primordial and all other existences are not similarly primordial. What does primordial mean in English? <laughs> huh? The root, primary. From the beginning. Or the root. Primordial is related to like before time. The primordial soup. That's the tobu So what is it in Hebrew? It's called Kadmain. Nothing, nothing came before. There was nothing before God. So God's existence. So the first, so the first existence is. Yeah, but but the po the point of being the first existence is that there was nothing before. In other words, the 13 it, principles is the no. principle of 13. What's, what's, what's no, this is a different set of principles. And God is without time, right? There was no before, and there is no after. But what exactly is time, and how did it begin? How does time start? Bara. So there are, there are some philosophers, scientists, philosophers, maybe even Newton, who believe that time is, an, is, a, is a reality. <clears throat> in and of itself. In time, things happen. Similar to the belief that space is an ether. Like a, like a soup. <laughs> and in that soup, there are planets. And they move around in the ether. There are people who, Einstein said there's no such thing. According to Einstein, what is outer space? What is empty space? Vacuum. Empty space is the effect that a planet has for some distance around itself. It's like the energy that a planet, that a mass gives off. You take the planet away, there's no space. Right? So space means the, the, the vibrations of the presence of a, of a mass. Is, is that E equals MC squared? Is that that theory or is that something else? 
I have no idea. <laughs> that's what he said. He's talking about time and space. Yes. This is, he's talking about that it's relative. In other words, with space is there, well, it depends on if you're on that planet. If that planet is there, it's relative. So if you'd be on Mars, then it will be relative to Mars, which, by the way, I found out that's different, but I'm not going to do that. Why? But I'm E equals mc together. squared is an equation that expresses Einstein's theory that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Therefore, um, that, that um, mass is convertible to energy when you bring in the factor of the speed of light squared. Then you can convert mass to energy. And that is how, unfortunately, these temporal weapons were developed, which isn't what he wanted. Sorry about this. But it's all within his mind. It was his idea that the whole universe is one. This, this, he had this belief in optics. So, so what is, what is the, the consequence of his theory of, of space? that the entire universe is finite. There are only so many masses or objects. When the objects end, space ends. Whereas if you believe that there's some kind of ether into which the planets flow, how big is that ether? Goes on forever? Then the universe has no shape, has no, has no end. But according to Einstein, because space is the product of things, and there are only so many things, the entire universe is finite. So the same can be said of, of time. Is time just an existence? And into that existence, things happen? So things happen in time, but time goes on anyway, whatever. Or, time is the event itself. When something happens, that causes a past. It already happened. It causes the present. And since it's moving or it's happening, something is going to happen next. So is time an independent existence? Or is time the result of an activity? Take a look at text 8. God created time. When did he create time? How long did... <laughs> how much time did it take to create time? Is God still creating time? Because time goes on. So the first moment where God created time must have been an, an almost infinite potential of time. He created the first moment, and that contains everything, all of time. And now we're watching as that time unfolds. But there was that one moment of, like, massive time, and now we're seeing it play itself out. But take a look at text 8. Let's read the Hebrew. The Ta'anu Hakefim, uh, the atheists mm -hmm. argue concerning creation, and they say, Why didn't God create the world before he created it? 5,700, why not 5,800? And they considered this a valid question. And they began to ridicule it, and they said, maybe he created it when he did Mesibas Hamtona. He was waiting for something or maybe something was stopping him. They're ri ridiculing the idea of belief in God. But what is the truth? They didn't realize he built the Efshiri. They didn't realize that the question itself is nonsense. Ki 
Because when you say God created time, then you can't ask what happened before that. Before he created time, there was no before. All before and after is what God created. So when you're asking, why didn't God create time before time? It's a nonsense question. Text 9 from the Tzemach Tzedek. Like everything else God created, time is a creation. Hazman hu nivra, time is a creation. Something new brought into being out of nothingness, like all creation. Only God is timeless, for God is utterly beyond time, even of time as an incalculable expanse. Rather, the whole of time is in the continual present for him. Hmm? And it's all present. What we're going to find out is that there are two aspects of time. There are the separate, distinct moments of time, and there is the flow of time. Just like there's a line you make with your pencil, it's a continuous line, but if you look under a microscope, it's made up of dots. You can't just make a line. You have to make many, many, many dots that create the line. So an hour is one unit, but you can break that hour down to minutes, and then seconds, and then nanoseconds. So here's, here's a good question. God created space. Understandable. You want to have a world? <laughs> you got to have space. Why did he create time? Particularly if after Trias HaMason, when the world becomes perfect, there won't be time in, in the same way. So why create it? And what does free choice really mean? That we have command over the present. How do you use your time? God created the world so that it exists, but he had a purpose. He had a plan, which means he wants something to happen in the world. Because he wants something to happen, that creates time. In other words, he created grass, but not for it to just remain grass. He created the grass to feed the animal. So something has to change. The grass has to become animal. He created the animal, not just to have animal, he created the animal to serve the human, to provide for the human. And he created the human to actually change the world. So where do we see time mentioned in the beginning of creation? In the beginning. Huh? When, when he said today is Yam Rishain and tomorrow is Yam Shain. It was the morning of the Yeah. Yeah. There's a beginning, there has to be an end. Right, so the first word itself, Bereshis, has a, so much meaning. You can write a whole book on it. One of the th meanings of Bereshis is for a purpose. God created the world with a purpose. What does it mean, a purpose? For something to happen. That's where time comes in. So if God was content with the world as it is, there would, there would be no need for time. 
He created Earth. Earth is perfect. Great. What do you need time for? So time comes as a result of intention or purpose or kavana. People get depressed from time. No one ever gets depressed from space. In fact, uh, the psychologists say the worst, most dangerous condition is when people have free time. We don't know how to handle free time. That's why during holidays, the hospitals are much busier. You would think when people go to work, there'll be accidents, they'll get hurt at the job. So the hospital should be more busy during the work day. But it's not. It's much busier during holiday. Because people are not good at handling time. Why is that? Space doesn't demand choices or activity or changes. Time demands change. A minute went by, what did you do? Why do I have to do anything? Because time is moving. You lost that time. So if an hour goes by and you didn't do anything, you start to feel guilty, subconsciously. <laughs> Consciously, you're thrilled. <laughs> you can be a couch potato. I don't have to do anything. I get the whole day off. And by the end of the day, you're depressed. Because time went on and you didn't. So the whole point of time is change. Change means progress. Progress means purpose. Purpose means fulfilling the reason for which you exist. If you're not fulfilling the reason for which you exist, but time goes on, now you're being, you're being, uh, harassed by the, by the passing of time. So again, where did time come from? The fact that God has a purpose. So again, God created space so that there's a world, and he created time so that the world would accomplish something. Now let's see the other way around. Because God wants the world to accomplish something, that's why there is time. There is before and after. God puts that time into our hands in Bereshis, where it says, Be fruitful and multiply, pruravu, milu es haaretz, fill the world, vikifshuha, and master it. Fill the world means space. Master the world means time. So God gives us time and space and makes it ours, our responsibility. What should we do with space? Fill it. Be fruitful and multiply. What should I do with time? Master it. Harness the world and make something out of it. That's time. Changes. As we will see, since God gave us time, in other words, gave us power over time, we can actually affect the past and we can affect the future. <clears throat> Based on the, on the fact that God is creating the world constantly, when we realize God is creating the world constantly, like in text 10, <coughs> 
המחדש בטובי בכל יום תמיד מעשה ברישס. God didn't create the world once and then set it into perpetual motion. He has to create the world constantly. I want to ask a question, I'm sorry. You said, since God gave us power over time, he could actually affect the past and the future. Mm-hmm. How can we affect the past? We can only affect our, we can only affect our perspective of the past. We could possibly affect the future, but... How? Um, by doing things differently than the way it was done in the past. Maybe learning from the past. Learning <laughs> from the past? Well, the past has, has a certain outcome. If the, uh, if the outcome of the present, if, if you change the outcome of the present or in the future, then the outcome of the past events change, changes. The purpose of those events next step. I don't understand how we can actually affect the past. Okay. All right. And also, it's like Chuba, yeah? Yeah. And by the same, by the same token, can we really affect the future? Well, if I act different. So say you go to work every single day. On Monday, you accidentally forgot your lunch. So Monday evening, you'll say, tomorrow, I will remember my lunch. So you affect the future by doing it differently the next day, you know. That's affecting the future, but like... But what if I say, tomorrow I will not forget my lunch, but I forget my lunch. (laughs) So all I'm changing is the present. All I'm affecting. I'm affecting the present. Now I'm thinking... Unless you're conscious and remember it. Yeah, now I'm thinking clearly. What's going to be tomorrow? I don't know. I forget again. (laughs) So do my plans today really affect tomorrow? Yeah, we try. We try, but no. Your mind is affected. You feel more guilty because you forgot a second time. But yes, your plans definitely affect. Your plans they definitely affect. I think our mind today is affected by that plan that we're worried about tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, but that's so perspective. that's sort of a different that's, reality of it. Yeah, but that's perspe- that's a perspective. That's no, a perspective. Mind, okay, so let's <coughs> so let's change it. Not not that I intend not to forget. I prepared tomorrow's lunch. Will that affect the future? Stick it in your briefcase and hang your briefcase by the front door. I mean, you might forget your briefcase or something. Yeah, you might forget your briefcase, but you created food for that day. You created food for the future. So what is God doing when he's recreating the world every moment? Is he trying to control the future? We don't control our destiny. He's giving us free right? choice. But we try to invest in this future. Like, we don't try to plan not to fail. You know? We could argue. We could just follow the example. Like this. Oh God. Is that how we're created in God's image? <laughs> so let's let's take a look. Text ten says. God is constantly recreating the world. Since the world consists of time and space, it means God is constantly recreating time. What does that do for us? Look at figure on back on page 68. The, the name Havaya, Yutke Vovke, has the letters of both, of all three. It was, is, and will be. Ha-ya. The he, the yud, and the he is was, past. He, and above and a he, is he which means present. And the whole name together with the yud in the beginning is will be. So in the word, in the letters, you have past, present, and future. And we refer to God by that name, saying that he is all three, which can mean that he is involved in time, or because he's all three, he's beyond time. That's just a name. So, what do we gain by understanding that God is creating the world all the time. Take a look at text 11. Said, and something just interesting happened. She said, it is time, and you said it's just a name, but we know that the name is the essence of a person, right? So 
it Maybe touches the essence. Touches the essence. Maybe. But of course, a person can exist without a name. So it's not the person. A nameless person is still... The John Doe is still... Um, it says renews. Yeah. That renews implies that it, yeah, that it's not something brand new in our perspective. That it's renewed. So it uh, has a different flavor. The idea in the simple meaning is he created it, but he's creating it again. But creation means something new. that didn't exist before. So it's not describing the creation, it's describing the creator. It's like, he is doing it again. He's acting again. He's doing the same thing again. But the world that he creates is brand new. Well, let's see. Text 11. This is from the Shalom. Shalosh, the letters Shin Lamed He stands for Shnei Luchais Habris. That was the Sefer, which interestingly, completely off topic, um, when, when the author named his Sefer the, uh, the Ten Commandments, Shnei Luchais Habris, it was held against him. How can you call your Sefer? Right? And he suffered for it. There was another Sefer where the author named, his name was Moshe, and he named his Sefer Teiras Moshe. Mm. That was a bit too ambitious, mm -hmm. and it was held against him. And I think even the Rambam called his Sefer Mishnah Teira, and that's, a, again, too close to uh, the, real thing. the real thing. So. <coughs> There was one day, uh, Adin Steinsaltz was uh, by dollars, I believe, and the Rebbe said to him, completely un without warning, the name Steinsaltz, it sounds very harsh. Stein means stone, Zaltz means salt. It's hard, it's harsh. It's, you should change your name to something more pleasant. And he, obviously he was stunned because the last name, the family name, is not, not that meaningful that it makes any difference. Some people say that Ebba suggested Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> or Freidman, like a happy person, like so, something positive. Did he ever change it? No. Evan Yisrael. Yisrael. Which is a bit of an improvement. It's still stone, right? <laughs> so there was, there was this, everybody was wondering, puzzled. What's, see it turns out, he had just translated the Gemara and it was called the Steinsaltz Talmud. And the Rebbe was saying, uh, you can't take it back, so stop being Steinsaltz. See, the other, the art scroll, was called, what is it called? Their, their translation of the Talmud. The yeah. The Schattenstein edition. The right? It wasn't called the Schattenstein Talmud. But this was called Steinsalz Talmud. So anyway, that could be the reason. So, in the Shalom, he writes like this. And, and by the way, part of uh, Tanya... The Alter Rebbe says it's based on what I learned and what I read. One of the things that he read was the Shalom. The other is the Maharal of Prague. So he says like this. People think as follows. God created everything out of absolute nothing. And early on, God gave the, um, the planets the power 
to conduct the, the earth. Ha'olam kemen hagei neheg. And now the world is following the influence of the of the planets of the okeviyachol zaza yode mehem, and they as, they assume that God is no longer involved in running the world. Rak im leesha itim reitzel lishded esam unless. On occasion, God wants to change something, then he interferes. The Cholzman she'enim meshadid, but as long as he's not interfering, ozman higam bekeach shehusag lehem be'ez habriya. Then the stars, what is it called? The uh, what is it called? The astrological system. The astrology. The galaxy. The the heavenly bodies, right, are are running the world. But the truth is, Hashem God has to renew everything in creation constantly. And he is doing it with intention and with purpose. And if he would stop for a second, all that exists would not exist. Botel Hamitsius, there would be nothing. So if God's constantly renewing the world, can he um, make it so that mistakes that we made in the past can be um, may notice like chuba mistakes? Could be, um, yep. What what are the consequences? Negated, you know, like the re- uh, fixed. What are the consequences of this <coughs> of this fact? If God is creating the world anew every second, the first thing that we get from that is we are not enslaved by the past. In that poem where it says the past is gone, it doesn't exist. Why? Because you can't control it? No. Because the world today is an entirely new world. It was recreated out of nothing. In the new world, there are new possibilities. You're not enslaved by the past. In fact, that's exactly what time means. Time means change. What is change? Not what was something new. Otherwise, you're not really changing. You're just dragging. (laughs) You're just continuing. Change means that what was is no longer, now something different. How is it possible for something different, for you to be different than you were a moment ago? Because you were just created. It's hard, it's hard to imagine, but if God is creating the world at every second, it also means that the world stops existing every second. So it's like stop, start, stop, start. So at any second, at any moment, you can say, the world just stopped. Since it can't exist without being created, it has a dual personality. It is and it isn't. What does it mean it isn't? How, how is it possible for a person to go from being sad to being happy? Or the opposite? How do you go from being happy to being sad? Being attached to what's happening around you, being connected to what happens around you and to you. And then what happens when a person becomes addicted? He can't change. He can't move from one condition to another. But every healthy person, I was very, very angry. 
Yeah, so what happened? Moved on. You, I moved on. So where did the anger go? Where did it go? <laughs> it never existed. I was never really angry. <laughs> and it's about to come back in a second. <laughs> Why is that possible? What makes it possible to go from one mood to another? We have free choice. Realizing that it's the Sahara. Okay. That's what I do. Because I think we've learned that melancholy and so if you were, sadness is the Yetzirah. It's the Sahara. So if you were in the Sahara, how did you get out? Identify. Sometimes time moves on. I just what, what does that mean? You made a decision. You made a choice. So what? Sometimes you don't make a choice. It happens. see the situation so if you see the situation differently, it changes the situation? No. So the situation was never real? Your view. Your view well, you know that right now you have a new choice. Do I, have, do I have to continue being angry, or can I do something else? Why is that possible? You can't change anyone else. Because you can only change your own behavior. You see, because while you're moment. angry, look at this. While you're angry, if I would suggest to you, you know, you don't have to be so angry. <laughs> that makes me angry. That, <laughs> right? I take my life in my hands. <laughs> so if while you're angry, I suggest that, you know, you don't have to be angry. That would not compute at all. I am angry. It's real. So, well, stop it. <laughs> stop it? What, anger is not real? I'm making myself angry? No, uh -uh, I'm angry. Say, so, well, think positive thoughts. <laughs> Take a deep breath. How is it that the reality, and, and it really is real, I'm, I'm into anger. <laughs> okay, well, enough of that. Now get happy. Is it really? It does work. The question is, how come? What it implies is that anger has a little bit of humility to it. It allows you, it allows you to, to, to disregard it. I'm like saying, chesed allows room for gvura. Otherwise, if you were chesed, you would be only chesed. If you were gvura, you would be only gvura. How is it possible to go from one to the other? or even to have a combination, because they each allow the existence of the other. And that's called bittel. There's a certain humility to the creation itself. Without that, there would be no harmony. There'd be no movement from one to the other. Everything would be rigid and fixed. So if you're angry, you'll never be happy again. And if you're happy, you'll be giddy forever. <laughs> There'd be no movement or change from one to the other. So in order for movement to be possible, there has to be a certain flexibility to creation, to reality, which is a certain humility that recognizes, as if to say, I'm not the only thing. I'm very angry. The anger itself is saying, I am anger, but I'm not the only thing in the world. So if you give me a good reason, I'll let you shift to something else. Where does that humility come from? From the fact that God has to recreate it every moment. If it exists independently, then it has no humility. It doesn't recognize a creator. If it doesn't recognize a creator, it doesn't budge. Like Pari, he wouldn't budge. He had to be broken with ten plagues in order for him to budge. Because he did not recognize a power other than his own. 
But in nature, see, that's a human being with his free choice. But in nature, there is a natural humility because every second it stops existing. So how could it be rigid when it experiences its own recreation out of nothing? So a moment ago I was nothing, now I'm going to be rigid. Now I'm the only thing that exists. Doesn't. So the fact that God is recreating the world every second gives the world the ability to move, to be fluid, to, to switch, to change, to react. Without that, everything would be so arrogant that nothing would ever change. That's what happened in the world of chaos, in Toihu. There was a world of chaos. It was totally rigid and inflexible, and it broke. It, it burst, because it can't. There's got to be some flexibility. Because it didn't recognize that it wouldn't always be, or it wasn't always being created. There was no humility in it. And it didn't leave room for its opposite. So chesed would not allow gvura. Gvura would not allow chesed. So, y so you can't create a world, or an orderly world. But, but if the world is recreated every second for Hashem, there is no past, no future in, 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 in Hashem. It's recreated every second. Then there is no change there. There is no past, there is no future. Every second it's, it's new, the existence is only in the creation, in the moment. How is there change, past, future, where is there? Right. Obviously God is above the, the time, and for him it's all the same, but for us it's not. So in, in Hashem there is no, no change? The only change is in us, and that's all that he really cares about. <laughs> the change in us. Now, it's interesting, that I'm not sure it's, it's necessary for our, for our purpose, but we just quoted, the Shalom says, if God stops creating, everything would stop existing. Now look, the al Rebbe adds one other point, which is fascinating. The Alter Rebbe says, if God stopped creating the world, it would return to nothingness. Look at the last sentence of text 12. If the letters of the ten utterances by which the world was created during the six days of creation were to depart from it, but for an instant, God forbid, it would literally revert to naught and absolute nothingness, which the Shalom already said. The Al Rebbe adds, exactly as before the six days of creation. Mamash. So first of all, the Rebbe says, God forbid. Notice? If God would stop creating the world, God forbid. Would it be so terrible if he stopped creating the world? I mean, really, we need this. And the Rebbe says, no, God forbid. The world is important. But what does it mean that everything would revert to nothingness exactly as it was before creation? Well, yeah, it's nothingness, right? What, do you, what is this adding? It's adding a something very, very significant. If, if everything stopped, the world disappears, nothing exists anymore. Is that like before creation? No. Because? There was something. Because now the world doesn't exist anymore. Before creation, it never existed. So once, you, once something is, no matter what you do to it, it'll never be the same again because it will have existed. So it won't have a future. 
and it won't have a present, but it'll have a past. It existed in the past. But you see, since time is part of creation, if God stops creating, there would be no time either. So the past would stop existing. So the world would not exist exactly as it didn't exist before it was created. It wouldn't even have been. A little hard, that's a little hard to imagine, right? In other words, the, the presence, the object would disappear, but so would time. So there would be no past to say, well, it used to be. There would be no used to be. There would be no past. I, I don't know. I'm feeling like at some point, that's what's going to happen. Hmm? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to break it to everybody, but that's how I feel. <laughs> well, that's depressing. <laughs> that's what's going to happen at some point. I'm to live in the present, but if I have to think about it, <laughs> Why does that feel right? Because at some point we're all going to go back to the original state, which was even after Mashiach comes. Like we're all after, and there's phases, and it speaks about all those phases. And then the whole big idea is that we return to that godly, what we become the essence of, of, of God. We become, we return to his, to, to, right? If we all have that little spark and this whole world is full of little sparks, it's all about revealing the spark. Then that spark, once it's revealed, becomes part of the being that it was to begin with. And what was it to begin with? God. What's wrong with that? Nothing. If there's just no past, present, or future, and then it's just, there's, it's him. And that's what it was before time, before the creation. There was no past, there was no present. Like you just said, it's, um, time is part of his creation. So we will become like him. We will also be timeless. Mm -hmm. Right, but there's no... That's not so depressing anymore. <laughs> no, because there's... Because the whole idea of time was created for, for this purpose of creation. So what happens to everything that happened in this world all these years? When the world ceased to exist the way it... it it's the ultimate. That's I'm the saying? goal. That's the goal. It's like what happened to the flower in your cake when you put it in there. It's no longer flower, but it's in a cake. And it becomes something different than flower. So why did it have to be flour? Why couldn't it just be cake? Yeah, no, I get it. I get no, 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 no. Why does there have to be gullus and then there's geula? Because, that's his because it was a purpose in the creation. In, form. in the gullus. Will that purpose ever completely disappear? I think so. So we read in the Haggadah that we will be telling the story of, the egg, of, of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim even after Mashiach comes. Okay. Why? So the time will still exist then. Because? And then we'll still have time then, we'll have past. The Alter Rebbe says, I think, that after, after Mashiach comes, we will look back at Golis nostalgically. Mm -hmm. I wish that we were able to do more. Yes. Because there's something special about Golis about thirsting for God compared to not being thirsty. So both are valid. And that's why the Rebbe would sing Kain Bakedesh Chazi Sicha. When everything is perfect, I hope I still feel the way I feel now. So when I miss you very much and then you come home, is that a step down? Because I don't miss you anymore? Right. So I want to retain that even when you're home. So it's not a matter of past or present, it's a matter of value. There's something valuable about this that will continue forever. It, it, it'll, it will also become timeless. So the timelessness is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And it doesn't mean we'll stop existing.
Okay, so let's take a look at text 13 and we'll learn a little Aramaic. You ready for this? In case you needed a second language, here's, a, here's your second language. Chad Bey Shimshi. One afternoon. Yes, make sense? Chad is like Echad. Bey Shimshi is like Bein Hashmoshes. One evening. And, and what does is, what is the word Shimshi come from? Shemesh. Sunset, right? So one sunset, Chazye, he saw, who saw? Rabbi Hanina ben Deysa. He saw Librate, he saw his daughter, Bas, Brate, the Havas Atziva, that she was sad. Omar lo, so he said to her, Biti, Limai Atzives, why are you sad? Omrole, so she said to him, Kli shel chemetz, a vessel of vinegar, nishalefli, uh, got confused by me, bechli shel shemen, with a, with a vessel of oil. Vihidlakti mimenu er l'shabbos. And I used the vinegar to light a candle for Shabbos, which means it's going to go out in a minute. Omar lo, so Rabbi Hanina ben Deysa said to his daughter, B.T., my ichpat loch, what difference does it make to you? Why should you care? Mi she'oma la shemen v'yidlik, he who told oil to burn, hu yema la chemetz v'yidlik, he will tell the vinegar to burn. Tana, we, we learned, we were told, that hoya delik, that candle burned, the helech kol hayem kuli. Not only the night of Friday, but it lasted a whole Shabbos. Ad sheheviyu mimenu ur lahavdala. Until they used that light for the havdala. Until, until after Shabbos. What is this telling us? Not just that a miracle can happen, but it explains what exactly a miracle is. The daughter was upset because vinegar doesn't burn. What did her father say to her? Why does vinegar not burn? It's not your problem. Why does vinegar not burn? Why, why does oil burn? So naturally we would say it is the nature of oil to burn. It is not the nature of vinegar to burn. But what does that mean? When you say it is the nature, what do you, what do you mean? You mean, that's, that's the way it is. You didn't explain anything. Why does oil burn? Oh, it's natural. Which is exactly like saying, I don't know. <laughs> right? When you say it is nature, you're saying, I don't know, just is. The purpose of its creation. Which means oil doesn't burn. God tells it to burn, so it burns. So what do we learn from this? It's not just that God tells oil to exist. It also has to tell it what to do. So that's like space and time. That it exists, that's space. Whether it burns or not, that's a matter of time. That's a, it's an event. An event can change. It's fluid. So God tells oil to burn. If he doesn't tell it to burn, it won't. God tells vinegar not to burn. If he tells it to burn, it'll burn. So when the, when the vinegar burned, was that a miracle? It's the same miracle though, that when the oil burns. So you can either say everything's a miracle, mm -hmm. or you can say nothing's a miracle. <laughs> so
So again, what makes the vinegar flexible enough? It could burn, it could not burn, depending on what God tells it to do. It's because the vinegar itself has a certain humility. Tell me what to do, I'll do it. Not like, hey, I don't burn, I'm vinegar. <laughs> Imagine vinegar says, me, burn, no, no, I'm vinegar. And God says, you're nothing. <laughs> no, you, every second you're nothing. And I have to recreate you. So listen up. <laughs> and it listens. Because it senses its own non-existence at every moment. So it's not like, <laughs> you know, how uh, you get this, this video and it kind of stalls. You know, like it stops for a second, starts again. You know, life is not like that. <laughs> for some people it is. But they got problems. Life is seamless. And yet, it stops existing and starts existing. So you can say, well, it happens so fast. That's a movie. The movie reel moves so fast that you don't realize that it just stopped and started again. Because that little black thing between the, between the frames, you don't see it because it goes so fast. Life is a little more fluid than that. It's not really, like, for how long does it stop existing before, it start, before it's recreated? For how long? Tiny, tiny, tiny second? Not really. It is constantly existing and not existing. Stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Right. Because that would be really... Uh, <laughs> hard on the bodies, hard on the bodies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like the people who, who, who don't know how to get their foot off the brake when they're driving. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Just drive. <laughs> no, but you gotta, you gotta stop. <laughs> so, again, what does this tell us? Let's skip 14 because we already said that. We did 16 already. Okay, now. Text 17, page 78. Amar Reish Lakish. The Gemara says, in the name of Reish Lakish, G'dayla Tshuva. How great is Tshuva? How powerful is Tshuva? Shazdei Neis Nasele Kishgages. When you do Tshuva, your intentional sin gets transformed into an unintentional sin. It's reduced from an intentional sin to an accidental sin. So the Gemara asks, Reish Lakish, but we also heard that Reish Lakish himself said, G'dayla tshuva, how great is tshuva? Shezdeinais nasale kezachies. The power of tshuva is that your intentional sin can be transformed into a mitzvah. And the Gemara answers, Loi kushya. It's not a contradiction. Kan me ahava, kan me yira. When Reish Lokish said that the intentional sin turns into an unintentional sin, that's the tshuva that you do out of fear, which is a lower level tshuva. When he said that the intentional sin can become a mitzvah, that's if you do tshuva out of love. Either way, the, the, the good news is that you can change the past. The sin is in the past. Your tshuva can change it from an intentional sin to an unintentional, or if it's a greater tshuva, it can actually transform it from an intentional sin, which is the worst, to a mitzvah, which is the best.
other than intention. Right, okay. Text 18. What is tshuva? So the Al-Tareb explains it in Tanya. He says like this. This is tshuva out of love, coming from the depths of the heart, with great love and fervor, and from a soul passionately desiring to cleave to God and thirsting for God like a parched desert soil thirsts for rain. For inasmuch as his soul had been in a barren wilderness and in the shadow of death, which is the other side, unholy, and infinitely removed from the light of God's presence, his soul now thirsts for God more than the soul's of tzaddikim. As our sages say, in the place where a Baal stands, even the perfect tzaddik cannot stand. Concerning this tshuva of such great love, the sages have said that the Baal deliberate sins become like virtues because it is through them that he has achieved this great love. So what is the Altadeb explaining here? What does it mean your sin becomes a mitzvah? The nature of a sin is that it brings another sin. Sin corrupts. Once you're corrupted, you're more likely to do another sin. But when you do tshuva, what exactly is happening? The sin that you committed yesterday is causing you to desire closeness with God, which is usually the effect of a mitzvah. Because a mitzvah brings a mitzvah. Here, what's happening is that the sin is acting like a mitzvah. It's bringing you closer to God. So, the sin is motivating the tshuva. So it's intentional? I mean, yeah, it's like you said, like, God us, us like Hashem, <laughs> Hashem, does he give us a choice to sin or not? Or we have to sin so we can do tshuva? I mean, does he, because he puts I, ideas in our heads sometimes. I think we have to sin. <laughs> Seriously, we have I to think it's requ- choice sometimes? I think it's required. <laughs> Come on, what would life be without sin? Huh? Well, the struggle itself. So where it says, where it says, I think it's in Tanya. No, no, it's in Tanya. Somebody who decides to sin on purpose, he, he plans on it ahead of time. Oh, yeah, I'm going to sin, but then I'll do Cuba later. That person's never going to get a chance to do Cuba. Because. You can't bargain on it. You have to. Make a mistake, make a mistake. We can't bargain on it. Right. Why is it? Why is it that if I intend to do tshuva when I sin, then I then I can't do tshuva? Tshuva means regret. I'm not regretting. It's all part of the plan. But what if you're regretting it when you're doing it? Like I wish I wasn't doing this, but here I go anyway. Uh, that's not regret. For example. That's not regret. That's just a damper. That just takes the fun out of it. It's not, it's not regret. But listen, listen, listen to this. How is it that the sin motivates the tshuva? Think, think about this for a minute. You sinned intentionally, cold-bloodedly, premeditated. You don't like it. You don't like the result. Which means, which means that your connection to God and your love for God is not very strong. Yeah. But now, your love for God makes you want to be better. Yeah. Where was your love for God when you sinned? Yeah. Well, that's our struggle as humans. So what's the dynamic? How does this work? I really am not so committed to God, who I love, but, eh, you know. So I go ahead and I sin intentionally. Now I'm regretting. 
Well, what? What's causing that regret? Your love for God? Obviously not. The love of God that you have didn't stop you from sinning. It's not going to cause you to do tshuva. So what is? What's causing you to do tshuva? Maybe every moment is recreated, so then this next moment I'm remembering that, oh, there is a God here. I knew there was a God when I sinned. Yeah. It didn't stop me. <laughs> if you forgot, then it's an unintentional <laughs> sin. <laughs> so why weren't you afraid when you sinned? The whole thing is like self-absorbed. So it's like, so if you weren't if you weren't thinking about God when you were, so basically you were saying freak out God and sin, but. I'll regret, and then you want to do tshuva, but it would be self, it's just coming from yourself. It's all about yourself in that case. Or maybe from your perspective, you didn't really think you were sinning. Right. Then why would you do tshuva? Because After you, you, you wised up. You got smarter. It's because we have inside us. You ourselves. saw from another perspective rather we, than what you, even, even, even if you think you're doing good, but according to another person, it's not so good, let's say. Yeah. So imagine a father and a son, perfect, perfect father, perfect son. Then the son does something really bad, and the father is very angry and even hates his son. But then the son apologizes, and they make up, and now... The father loves his son more than before. Where did more come from? It's not like previously he didn't really love him. He really loved him. So what is more love? What, what, what's more? Well, he sees that his child wants the relationship as well. It wasn't just him feeding because it's a father or son, but he actually sees the worthiness of the, the, worthiness of the um, And how does he see it? The relationship. What? Where does he see it? When, when they make up and the son no comes more. to the father. In other words, <laughs> only because he did something bad does the father love him more. How does that work? If he had never been bad, his father would just love him. But because he did something bad, now his father loves him. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Sinning is necessary. <laughs> But does he love him more? He does. Where did the more come from? It's endless. Parents love their children no matter what. Well, they say so that was, a, that was before he sinned. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so what's more? Because the son's love was more because he recognized he was tested. his father's, what he was doing so to his father. I think, I think the real secret is he loved his son maximum with all the love he had. Then the son did something terrible. Now he loves him more. Where did more come? Where did he get more love from? From the son. The anger that he felt and the hurt that he felt has now been transformed into love. He has more love than he had before. Again, how can it transform? Everything is flexible because it has a certain humility to it. So it's actually the anger that increases the love. And that also elevates anger. It gives anger its positive purpose for existing when it gets transformed into positive. The same thing is true with tshuva. What makes the Baal tshuva do tshuva? The sin. When he realizes where he is as a result of the sin, like you just lost your father's affection, that don't feel good. And that motivates a return. 
So it's the loss of affection that increases affection. So what causes the tshuva? The, the painful regret. I don't like this. I don't want to be here. This is like in a wilderness, dying What's of thirst. It? Huh? What's feeling it? Is it the, it's not the physical human being. Yeah, how do we feel it? Who's feeling it? Only the Nisham is feeling it. Is that the way? Physically it? don't feel it. I'm asking. It could be. It could be only the godly soul feeling it. The godly soul that never really wanted to do the sin even while you were sinning. Or it can even be the intelligence of the animal soul. Your nefesh asichlis. So even, even physically, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to be wrong, even to the animal soul, if, if the animal soul has some sensitivity. So how does a person change the past? Not only in his mind. The past should be causing you to sin more because one sin brings another. And yet, because of something you did now, you are changing the, the event of the past, and now it is causing you to do something positive. That's what it means. Tshuva is retroactive. Like the Rebbe once said, that if you hadn't gone to the mikveh and a child was born, if you go to the mikveh now, after the child was born, it will retroactively affect the child as if the child was born with the mikveh. Here's a way, one way of looking at it. There are two kinds of regret. There is the regret of what could have been. A person regrets, he made a decision, and it was the wrong decision, and it could have been different. Like, for example, I invested in the wrong stock. I should have invested in the other stock. And they told me to invest, and I didn't listen. I really regret that. Deeply regret that. Or I could have bought that building for $9, like, <laughs> like Jackie Mason says, and they talked me out of it. Had I bought that building, I would now be a millionaire. That's one form of regret. I regret what could have been. There's another kind of regret, and that is, I regret what should have been. I should have been better to my mother. I regret it. I should have been a better friend to my friend. I should have done the mitzvah, and I didn't. There are two differences between these regrets. The first is, if I regret what could have been, what do I accomplish? The future would have been different, but nothing. nothing. I regret very deeply not buying that building. So now the building is a little mine? Nothing changes. But I regret it. But I wish I had bought that building. <laughs> Nothing changes. Yeah, but you learn a lesson because the next building you'll buy. Maybe. Sometimes Maybe. too late, never comes again. Yeah, sure. This is about loss of time. Yeah, 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 loss of time. The regret is ineffective. All it does is make me miserable. But it doesn't change the fact that I did not buy that building. <laughs> or like Jackie Mason said, so buy it now. Well, now. Now is too late, right? <laughs> but if you regret what should have been, you should have been better, nicer to your friend. Doesn't that regret make you nicer? It does. So the regret for what could have been is just depressing, pointless, useless. The, the regret for what should have been actually changes the reality. You are nicer. And what makes you nicer? 
the fact that you weren't nice. So the past negative has now turned into a positive through your regret. So when you regret what could have been, you're not changing anything. When you regret what should have been, everything changes. The regret is what I did before was a negative and uh, corrup corrupting reality. Now I've turned it into a positive and productive reality. It, it, is, it is making me, I am now nicer. Something has changed. So the conclusion of the whole thing is this. Since God is creating the world constantly, the world reality is flexible. Because it's flexible, it can change which means I have the ability to change the past. I am not its victim. I master it. By the same token, I can change the future. I can influence the future. Like it says, who, whoever prepares before Shabbos has what to eat on Shabbos. Where's the wisdom in that? Yeah, if you get the cholon done before Shabbos, you'll have cholon for Shabbos. Why, why, do we, why do we need the Gemara to say that? Why do we need sages to make that statement? Mi shetarach be'erev Shabbos, yeichal b'Shabbos. Well, yeah. And why? It's not only Shabbos. If you make supper, then tonight you'll have what to eat for supper. I mean, like, what? Uh-huh. Right, and they won't have what to eat, right, so it's, which is what the statement is saying. It's common sense that people are missing. That's right. So why do you need a sage to say, have common sense? Because <laughs> some people don't. Yeah. So is, is there any advantage to all of this? Because it's not like there's a higher power that, that is... Is still a legal merit that isn't with all this up and down. Is this other, you know, saying that camel doesn't yeah, like a camel doesn't like up and a camel doesn't like a road that is up and down. A camel wants a straight path. So that Sadikim, they don't have this up and down. And yet there's a saying that, that Sadikim will do chuba. Like when Shia comes and Sadikim will do chuba. Is there a way for them to do chuba? And they didn't have to sin to get there. The, the Debra was once crying about that. He said, yes, there is a way for tzaddikim to do tshuva, but it's not the same. All right, here's the punchline. The quote that he brought from, from the Siddur, back in page 69, text 10. Read the sentence and tell me what, what it tells you. What is it telling you? This is an amazing statement. What it's saying is that God is creating the world every day. Why, why every day? Why not every second? The renewal of creation is visible when the seasons change, when the month changes, the moon disappears, reappears. The day, you see, the day ends, the day begins. So you see it's being renewed, another day. You don't see the renewal every second. So when the, when the when uh, David HaMelech says, you renew the world constantly, he picks the smallest, most, co most, re most frequent, obvious renewal, which is the day. But really, it's happening every second. So take a look at the sentence. 
Wow, God renews each day constantly the act of creation. Isn't that amazing? But did you notice the word goodness? You, you see what's going on here? He renews the act of creation in his goodness. What does that mean? God recreates the world constantly. That's really not very efficient. To have to do it every second again and again and again. Can't God be a little more efficient and just create a world that functions? Why do you have to keep creating it? The argument that the world can't maintain itself because it came out of nothing. Nothingness can't acquire talent. So why doesn't God give nothingness the ability to exist without him? You can't give nothingness anything. That's the argument. God has to recreate the world constantly because it came out of nowhere. But even that is part of God's creation. This law, this rule, that nothing can't, what, God can't make nothing able? He can make it exist. He can't give it a talent. So the argument is logical, but, but the logic is also created by God. So God created a world that cannot exist without being created every second. Why? Create a world that can. What is the answer? In his goodness. Out of goodness, God wants to recreate you every second. Why? The whole purpose of creation is to have this relationship. How will it enhance the relationship if I give you independent existence and I don't have to think about you ever again? If we really want to get right down to it, why does time exist? Because time is necessary for a relationship. It may not be necessary for existence. Could space exist without time? Technically, no. Einstein proved that. But that's technical. It's the way God created it. But why did he have to create it that way? He could have created space without time. Time is necessary because of the nature of a relationship. Closeness, distance. We are separate, but we are one. You are you, I am me, but can we become one? Change. Without change, there's no relationship. But what happens when the relationship becomes perfect? Like you're married already. <laughs> Now, ideally, there should be no change. It's like an old couple. There's no change. They don't have to get closer. There's no closer. They're bonded. They've merged. And they can't be without each other. But there's no need for change or growth because they've achieved it. Then, like after Mashiach comes, Time will stop existing because our relationship will have become complete. So let's say this again. The reason God created time, which means change, is so that there's freedom of choice. Why do we need freedom of choice? To engage in a relationship. And why do we need this relationship? That's why he created the whole world. So in order to have a real relationship, God had to create time, which means change. 
For the world itself, change is not a good thing. And that's why the scientist is convinced that because of change, we're basically running out. We're running down. Like, how much can you change? It takes energy. All movement takes energy. All change involves energy. And we're running out of energy. So eventually the sun is going to die. The planets are going to stop moving because how long can you move already? Right? We're running out of energy. And it's all going to collapse. It's all going to dry up. It's all going to stop existing. Why do they think that? Because of time. If time would stop, it wouldn't wear us out. We could exist forever. So why does God create time? Not for the benefit of the universe. The universe would be better off without time. God creates time for the benefit of a relationship. And this relationship justifies time and space. Because if space could continue endlessly without time, so what? What's the point? Who needs space? The only reason we need space is because we have a relationship that grows and changes. And that rela relationship needs a place, a dira betachtainim. Any questions left to be answered? <laughs> now the question is, what time is it? <laughs> Thank you. Overtime. Huh? Overtime. 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 But that's the question, Ayeka. When God asks Adam, Ayeka, he's saying, what time is it? What have you changed so far? Not... Not where are you in space, where are you in time? Because where he was in space, God knew. I mean, obviously, he was talking to him. <laughs> say, where are you? No, he knew where he was. Therefore, the question, Ayeka, has to be, where are you in time? What progress have you made? What change have you brought, positive or negative? 